Welcome back to Wednesday Night Fight Back. Now, tonight we're going to talk about whether we are headed for another banking crisis. We saw what happened in 2008, and it had massive effects on uh, the world economy and on households and everyone else. So I'm going to ask uh, Michael, do you think we are headed for a major banking crisis? No, I don't think we are. I think what we've got is a major banking problem, um, but it's not a banking crisis. Just to remind you what happened in 2007, 2008, which really was a crisis, a completely, a total meltdown. And that was because you had, at the time, going into that crisis, you had major financial institutions carrying, wait for it, $62 trillion, $62 trillion worth of credit default swaps. And the majority of those were being uh, traded between about 17 different major banks. And when you get to, and the, the problem was that, of course, once these start to go down, which they did start mm. to go down, mm. there's no netting off possible and at $62 trillion, every single bank in the world was bust. The mm. system was absolutely entirely bust because mm. of credit default swaps. We're not in that situation now. What we've got is a banking problem. And the problem is fairly obvious. The banks have been piling up uh, holdings of government debt. Mm. And these things are carrying maybe half a percent, maybe one percent, maybe one and a half percent. And, of course, now that interest rates are near a four percent or above, near five percent in some cases, these bonds are worth one heck of a lot less than they're carrying them on, on at book price. Um, and if you marked them to market, if you said, OK, these are, this bond I'm holding is not worth 100, it's now worth only 70, then you start to... Uh, realize that you've got colossal losses in there. Mm. And I think every financial institution, every bank is carrying those losses. So then you've got well, to say, say, what do you do about it? What can be done about it? Sorry, what do you... Yeah, I, mean, I, I, would, I mean, taking take, taking from that, I, I mean, I agree with you. Uh, my hunch is that we're probably not in a general bank crisis. Anyway, the causes are different. As you say, Silicon Valley Bank had a lot of venture capitalist depositors that, are, as far as I can see, just fled in a fright, but fundamentally... Well, they were all on the WhatsApp group, weren't they? <laughs> yes, yes, right, the point you made. So, that, so uh, one of the things that would indicate to me, as an observer, that we're not in a general banking crisis is that the problems at uh, Silicon Valley Bank and the problems at uh, Credit Suisse are quite different, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, they're, but I think the Silicon Valley Bank was they had... Uh, they were carrying these losses... Uh, the WhatsApp group of their depositors got wind of it and fled. And so the bank's over. Yeah. Um, and some of that will be recovered and some of it won't. Um, the problem is that everyone now knows that there is this big bond loss carry everywhere. Mm. And banks are trying to deal with that problem. They can do with it one of two ways. One, they can acknowledge a certain amount of those losses and take them against reserves. Or they mm. can carry on funding them. The trouble is that if uh, these assets you're holding pay 0.1% and you're funding at 5%, then you're going to take mm. profit, and lo profit and loss account. What that means is, you know, in theory, you can the system can trade its way out of this over a number of years. But when mm. you're doing that, everyone's going to be looking at the, for the badly managed bank that actually can't deal with it. Um, yeah, Credit Suisse was an obvious one. I mean, everyone knew that Credit Suisse has been a bad bank for a long time. Mm. And there are a number of other European banks, which I think are likely to come under considerable scrutiny over the next year or so. Well, but that's the point. When, yeah, you, may, you put a piece out, didn't you, about the, you know, where the structural weaknesses lie. Yeah. Uh, you know, is it in North America? Quite a few banks are in that category and uh, in, in Europe, in the Eurozone and elsewhere, and British banks came out not too bad. The, 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 I mean, but that's a general structural weakness, isn't it? And if things were to deteriorate, my worry is um, what I would, just looking at it very crudely, um, the loan books of many of these banks are based a lot, to a great extent, on, um, on property prices, on, on values. Yes. And I always tutor anyone that gets it, my background is commercial property, I always tutor anyone getting into it, the basic reality, which is that valuations are theory, 
and debt is reality. <laughs> yes, and that's, that's what right. I worry about. That's what yeah. I worry about. Yeah, and I think that's that's a reasonable, absolutely reasonable to to to, to worry about that. Um, you know, the way in which banks are going to have to trade their way out of this is going to be restricting credit for mm. years to come, probably for about the next five years. So within that, it's very bad news if you uh, are the uh, uh, shareholder of a bank, and it's very bad news if you're a shareholder of their major customers. And that, of course, does include commercial property, yeah. No, you, no, no doubt. Get... So this, this is a general, the best case is that you get a long but safe crush on various um, credit exposed sectors of the economy. But your, my worry is that we have an economy that's been addicted to debt, as we've written about, haven't we, in, in the yeah. SDP, the end of indifference, and um, tightening credit, uh, you worry that you end up in a doom loop, a general macroeconomic doom loop, credit tightens. <laughs> uh, you know, so that, are we there? Yes, William, we are. But we have been approaching this this moment for years. And it's the, absolutely mm. the reason why we write the stuff we write at, at the Social Democratic Party. Mm. That the economic model which we've been under for the last 40 years has gradually reached that stage. Every economic model does, where eventually the things that were going to solve your problems start to generate problems. And now mm. what's happening with this is those problems are now coming due. So yes, it is an absolutely... Uh, generational moment of crisis. It doesn't necessarily make it a financial crisis, but it does mean that it's a political crisis because the assumptions and the models on which the major parties seek to misgovern Britain mm. are broken, plainly broken. Yeah. Um, which is why we, we, we need a new model, which is investment-led and productivity-led. And, and has therefore savings-led as well. Exactly. You always make the point savings led as well. And that's a more robust situation. Well, Michael, that's what we advocate and let's hope we get it. <laughs> well, let's hope we get I have to say just, just one thing. Um, I know that people wanted me to write about the budget, but good Lord, why? Mm. I mean, why would one write about something that gave no answers to any of the problems that Britain faces? I mean, it, it really is as if they are completely blind to the problems and therefore produce solutions which are solutions for nothing well the major the major comment i made on it was that there was virtually nothing no no addressing of the major economic problem of housing nothing nothing substantial was said about it all no tweak was made no incentive offered to no. deal with the supply side and and it's you know that to to it, I, I agree, it was an entity, actually. <laughs> it really was. I sort of looked at it and thought, oh, God, I ought to write something about that. I just couldn't be bothered. What's the point? It's, it's irrelevant to anything that's interesting and needing to be done in this economy. Anyway, should we leave it there for the for time being, William? We've, uh, Thanks very much for your advice on that. Thank you. Oh, okay, Cheers, Take care.